are some pregnancies that are so strange, they baffle doctors and defy all medical logic. This is a case I will never forget. I still am shocked by the whole thing. Sarah was born with an extremely rare medical condition. She's like, well, you have two uteruses. Did you know that? But the 21-year-old's case would soon go from uncommon to unimaginable. This is really an absolute miracle. Then, Kim couldn't get pregnant, so her 55-year-old mother got pregnant for her. I was just dumbfounded, shocked. I didn't even know it was possible. A grandmother giving birth to her own grandchild? But the story becomes even stranger, baby by baby. There's a heartbeat. There's the second one. Wait a minute. And Jane had a pregnancy that never should have happened. She said, I don't believe what I'm seeing. But the real problem is what the doctors can't see. I can see your womb, and your baby isn't in the womb. Three families desperately trying to bring babies into the world. Three incredible stories of strange pregnancies. April 19th, 2008. Dr. Imogen Montague has brought thousands of babies into the world, but she's never faced a delivery as bizarre as this one. I've never seen anything like it before or since. In the fall of 2007, Jane and Graham Jones are living in the country outside Plymouth, a small town in southeast England. With two daughters and a pasture full of pets and farm animals, they're finally leading the life they've always dreamed of. The life has sort of just really settled down from a family perspective and a financial perspective. We got that stage in our life where things were quite easy. Day-to-day -day routines was work, horse riding, taking the children to school, cooking tea, and then out for a ride. Life was fine. But in October of that same year, Jane begins experiencing nausea and regular bouts of fatigue. She hopes that a visit to her doctor will clear things up. But what he tells her takes the 37-year-old by complete surprise. I found out I was pregnant. I had to tell Graham. I've got some news to tell you. What? We weren't planning on having any more. I, I was thrilled to bits when Jane told me uh, she was pregnant again. We sat down and we told the girls that evening. They were happy because they said that they wanted another sister or brother. And then life went on as normal. Having been through two pregnancies, Jane is familiar with the routine. But one afternoon, while doing the laundry, she's caught off guard by a searing pain in her abdomen. It literally brings Jane to her knees. At about 14 or 15 weeks, I started to get this real sharp pain that made me, like, double over. And when I went to the doctors and explained this, they said, because I was older, 10 years older, that it was all my pelvic and all that readjusting. And I just carried on day to day. But the pain got worse and worse. She has got a high pain barrier and intends to fight her way through it. And she doesn't moan about being in the pain. Jane d didn't make a lot of fuss at all, not openly. I did believe the doctors because it did make sense that I was older. But I knew deep down that there was something wrong, but I didn't know what. Then at 20 weeks in, Jane's obstetrician, Dr. Imogen Montague, finds something troubling during a routine ultrasound. And this looks like the womb here. And then you have the placenta, which is much larger and brighter than it should be. On the basis of the ultrasound scan, the baby was in the small end of normal range for a baby at 20 weeks gestation. There is also less than normal amount of fluid around the baby. And the placenta looked abnormal. She didn't know why I had an enlarged placenta because I didn't have it on the other two pregnancies. And she said that I had to come in and be monitored just to check that the baby wasn't struggling. If there is an abnormal placenta, there is always the risk of subsequent development of um, complications 
that are life-threatening for the mother. Jane and Graham were very upset and anxious because they suddenly had a pregnancy that was high risk with the possible complications of developing anemia um, or stillbirth. But the enlarged placenta diagnosis still doesn't explain Jane's excruciating pain. And as the weeks drag on, her suffering only gets worse. I spent a month sleeping, propped up, because as I lied flat, the pain was just unreal. It was just horrendous. Then at 26 weeks, Jane is undergoing another ultrasound when Dr. Montague spots something new on the scan, something shocking. She said, I don't believe what I'm seeing. I can see your womb to the right-hand side, tucked over here near your appendix, and your baby isn't in the womb. I saw what looked like an empty uterus. I needed to get that diagnosis confirmed as soon as possible. She was amazed because she couldn't actually see a baby in the womb. The placenta had been covering the womb, and I think the placenta had moved out of the way, and then she could see that there was no baby in the womb. This has quite serious implications, and particularly for you. In an astonishing development, the baby appears to have been growing inside Jane's abdominal cavity on top of her bowel. It's an almost unheard of form of pregnancy and nearly always fatal for the baby. To confirm the diagnosis, Dr. Montague rushes Jane in for an emergency MRI. This is the almost normal, slightly enlarged uterus with a uterine cavity and the cervix down here, and the baby's entirely outside. Though the doctors share a combined 58 years of experience, they can hardly believe their eyes. She said the baby wasn't in my womb and it was attached to my bowel. It was just such a shock. I just looked at Graham and I thought, what do I do? Jane's condition is called an abdominal pregnancy. It's so rare, there are less than 100 documented cases in the world that have ever made it to delivery. At the time of conception, or very soon after conception, rather than the egg progressing down the fallopian tube and then implanting in the womb, which is the normal way of things, the fertilized egg floated into the abdominal cavity. In almost all similar instances, the egg quickly dies. But in Jane's case, the embryo caught a lucky break. It lodged on top of her bowel and against her abdominal wall quickly forming a placenta through which the baby could get blood and nutrients. I've never seen anything like it before or since. So then they told me why I was getting all that pain, because every time the baby moved, he moved the placenta, which, which was ripping the lining of my bowel. And that's what the pain was. With the diagnosis comes a frightening revelation. Jane's intestine is in danger of being severely torn at any moment. For Dr. Montague, the pregnancy now takes on a life or death urgency. There would be risk of bowel damage, massive hemorrhage. Hello, switchboard. And um, other life threatening complications to Jane. Okay, the patient's name is Jane Jones. She said this hasn't been done. Yes, yes, I mean, obviously this could be a catastrophic hemorrhage and there'll be a one in five chance of me and the baby dying. So yeah, it was pretty scary. There was a risk at that, to the baby at that stage um, that it would be back premature. They took us to the NICU unit. They explained the survival rate. There was a survival rate of about 25% at 25 weeks. I think up to 30 weeks, you were up to about 98%. But despite the dangers, Dr. Montague knows that delivering now at 26 weeks could have equally dire consequences for Jane's baby. She wanted to push the pregnancy as far as possible. I aimed to deliver Jane to just under 34 weeks. I also had given her a course of steroid injections to have the baby's lungs as mature as possible should a preterm delivery need to take place. It's me. Can you come home quick? There's something wrong. 
Jane was on the point of passing out with the pain. I think I'm having this baby. I just can't describe the pain to anybody. It was just horrible, horrible. Just try and relax. At this stage, I thought, do I call an ambulance or shall I get Jane to Derriford Hospital myself? Fearing Jane could die while they wait, Graham makes the 50-mile drive to the hospital himself. I'll just put my hazard warning lights on. Oh, mate, get out of the way. And I just drove so fast as I possibly could without injuring any, anybody else. I can remember the hazard lights going on and us going 100 miles an hour, hoping that he would pick up the police car so we could get escorted to the hospital. I jumped in my car, and luckily, I don't live far away from the hospital. Well, I was still in my gardening gear, so I trotted in and sort of kicked off my wellies at the door. And there were 16 people in theatre that afternoon, so it was quite crowded. It was myself and three other consultants, scrubbed plus scrub staff. We also had the neonatal consultant in theatre. Since the baby isn't in the womb, a traditional birth is out of the question, as is a cesarean. To reach the baby, they will have to do a laparotomy, a large vertical incision through Jane's abdomen. When we opened the belly, we could see the placental sac was in the mid-abdomen, attached to the back wall of the abdomen, under which you have your main blood vessels. These are blood vessels where, if they are torn or burst, will cause catastrophic hemorrhage, which is life-threatening within seconds and minutes. Dr. Montague decides her only course of action is to separate the baby from the placenta itself. She'll then leave the placenta attached to Jane's bowel in the hope that her body will eventually absorb it. We knew that if we had attempted to remove it, that Jane would have died on the table, and it would be much safer to leave nature to deal with that. But first, she has to find the baby. The placenta is obscuring her view so badly, she's forced to rely on scans to help locate him. The placental sac was very thickened and abnormal looking, and it looked bizarre. With extreme precision, Dr. Montague carefully frees the baby from the placenta. Then the team moves quickly. I rapidly delivered the baby, clamping the cord and passing the baby to the neonatal team. Weighing only two pounds, two ounces, the tiny baby boy goes straight from Jane's belly to a plastic sandwich bag. Babies are at risk of getting very cold very quickly, and hypothermia to a preterm baby is very damaging. So we routinely put our preterm babies straight into a plastic bag. All that was happening behind me while we then had a situation of a sudden catastrophic hemorrhage of blood welling up from the placental sac and the base of the placenta. In fact, Jane is losing more than two pints of blood a minute, a rate doctors can barely keep up with. They race against the clock to get Jane's bleeding under control. Massive transfusion using central lines and multiple drips in the arm. Finally, after 40 nerve-wracking minutes, Jane is stabilized. A few hours later, the 37-year-old mother holds her son, Billy, for the first time. I just couldn't stop crying because I had my little boy, and he was absolutely fine. Nothing to worry about. Billy, who's 12 weeks premature, is put in an incubator and kept in the hospital for 10 weeks. He was the size of Graham's hand, so very, very tiny. It could have been a very different story. We could have had both a stillbirth and a maternal death, which is always a tragedy. And I think it is a miracle. Come on, chick chicks. Out the way, chickens. Today, Billy's a healthy, happy two-year-old. And though he'll forever be known as the miracle baby, he seems like just yeah, another two. welcome addition to the Jones family. One, two. No. <laughs> Cannot believe it. He's absolutely fine. A normal two-year-old. When you see something so small and so helpless and you look at Billy now, it's uh, absolutely amazing.
October 11, 2008. In a Cleveland, Ohio delivery room, it's the culmination of one of the most astonishing pregnancies these doctors have ever encountered. Well, obviously, in the millions of pregnancies that are around the country, this was unique. Today is truly a day of rejoicing as we witness the uniting of this couple. Joe, do you take Kim to be your lawfully wedded wife as long as you both shall live? When Kim Lyons and Joe Casino tie the knot in December of 2005, it's the culmination of a long and romantic courtship. I worked in the nursing field in an emergency room, and Joe was a firefighter paramedic and came into the emergency room often. I agreed to go on a date, and we hit it off. The only shadow on their young marriage is that they're unable to have children. I had severe fibroids, which caused hemorrhaging, severe bleeding, severe enough that they had to do an emergency hysterectomy. I had previously been married and had two children, and I loved everything about being a mom and to be faced with the fact that I couldn't carry any more children myself ever. It was pretty final, and it was devastating. I always planned on having a family, um, at least two or three kids. When I met Kim and we weren't going to be able to have any, we knew there's other options. They briefly consider using a surrogate, but there's one big problem they can't overcome. The cost of surrogacy was just way too high for us to consider. The couple turns their sights to adoption, but several promising attempts fall through. We had a nursery set up, um, crib, bought clothes, all ready for the baby to come home, and, and it didn't happen, no baby. I didn't want to talk about it. We didn't want to talk babies, nothing. But someone they least expect changes all that when Kim's 55-year-old mother, Jackie, offers them a surprising new chance at surrogacy. I did not know if it was possible, but I went to Kim one day, and I said, I'll carry your kids if I can. I was just dumbfounded, shocked. Honestly, I didn't even know it was possible. Jackie's last pregnancy was 32 years ago. Now she's offering to give birth to her own grandchildren. One of my sister, well, they all at first thought, well, this is weird, you know? This is weird. What are the kids, the, their kids going to think? What are all the kids going to think? How are we going to explain this to people? Because it is different. You have to have that concern. What other people would say, and I didn't care what they would say, but in my opinion, it wasn't a radical thing. It was just a mommy thing. I did think, how am I going to feel? Am I going to feel, you know, sad, jealous? But it's my mother. Of all people, it's my mom. And I would trust nobody more. It didn't seem strange to me that Jackie would be carrying my children. It was a great thing that she stepped up to do for her daughter, and it just seemed very gracious. Offering is one thing, but Jackie is 55 and has already been through menopause. Hello. How are you? So good to see you. Good you too. So the first step is a battery of tests to see if pregnancy is even a possibility. The uterus doesn't tend to age, so uh, uterus, even after menopause, still can be stimulated with hormones to become receptive to an embryo. My uterus was healthy. He said I was healthier than a 30-year-old, so that was all good. But being over 50 brings its own set of risks. Although the track record has been unbelievably good for women over 50 getting pregnant, there still is more of a risk to somebody 50 years old or more than there's going to be somebody 25 or 30 years old getting pregnant. She could develop a pregnancy-induced hypertension and diabetes also because of her age. There could also be other medical conditions that could show up during pregnancy, particularly heart disease. Hello. Hello. Before a pregnancy can even be attempted, Jackie has to be brought out of menopause. Hormones like estrogen will restart her menstrual cycle. It will then need to be manipulated until it's on the same schedule as her daughter's. I had to have injections every day and take um, hormone pills. In the meantime, Kim will require hormonal stimulation to boost her egg count. We would give her shots twice a day, and it was very painful for her. We did this for a year, year and a half. And driving a three-hour trip, 
one way every day to the clinic so that we can make this happen. We were physically and emotionally just burnt out, exhausted, but you do it because you want it so badly. Much of the cost is not covered by insurance. The cost of in vitro fertilization is extremely high. You're talking about at least $12,000 per cycle. I picked up extra shifts at work, working about 70 hours a week, and Joe picked up an extra job on top of the fire department. After months of treatments, the perfect moment finally arrives, and two of Kim's eggs are extracted and fertilized with Joe's sperm. We transfer the embryos on the fifth day into Jackie's uterus. Doctor gave me a percentage was like 90% chance of only one taking, and I assumed that's what would happen. But two weeks later, they face bitter disappointment. Jackie's pregnancy test comes back negative. I never even thought about it not working. I was in shock, and I felt like my entire world crumbled down around us. And that was really hard. I felt like I failed them. We still did have some embryos left. So we set up to do it all over again. We had to go through the whole cycles again. Six weeks after their first attempt, they give it their last best shot. Two more embryos are implanted in Jackie's uterus. And once again, everyone holds their breath. We knew this was our last try. We were so fragile at that point. And then when Dr. Goldfarb called us and said, you know, it didn't work. We just didn't know what we were going to do next. That was probably the hardest part of our whole job, having to call such wonderful people and telling them that despite all the efforts they put in, it did not work. We uh, were absolutely crushed. And there was no hope after this. The dreams were gone. The money was gone. Emotionally, we were done. We had nothing left to give. Then out of nowhere, they get a stunning reprieve. Fertility specialist Dr. James Goldfarb tells the couple about a special program at the Cleveland Clinic. We have a uh, philanthropic organization that is set up just for this type of situation where couples have gone through in vitro fertilization cycles, have not gotten pregnant, and then can't afford another cycle. So that program offered them a free cycle. It was of the ray of hope. It was the opportunity to pay for what we couldn't. Physically, I knew I could do it. Emotionally, I didn't know if I wanted to do it. But I could see Kim. Kim had that little look in her eye, and she wanted to try it. So of course, you know, I, I did it. To increase their odds, this time doctors implant three embryos instead of two. With two failed attempts, we just felt that, you know, we'll transfer three. Hopefully, we'll get one healthy baby. Everything the family has hoped for rests on this third attempt. And two weeks after the embryos are implanted, the moment of truth finally arrives. Jackie's pregnancy test. I answered the phone, and she's like, we're pregnant. And I'm like, no way. It was the absolute best feeling I've ever had in my whole life. Kim shares the amazing news with her two children that their grandmother is pregnant with their baby sister or brother. Brittany and Colin at first were shocked like I was that, that it could be even possible that grandma would be carrying my child, their sibling, but they accepted it. That was fine with them. Clinic officials believe Jackie may be the oldest surrogate in the United States. Obviously in the millions of pregnancies that are around the country, this was unique. But the excitement is far from over. When Jackie has her first ultrasound, the family gets even more unbelievable news. And they said, congratulations, you're having twins. Not only one, but two of the embryos have successfully implanted. We could not have been happier. We were just on cloud nine. But nine weeks into the pregnancy, Jackie starts bleeding. She's rushed to the hospital, fearing she's losing the twins. This doctor called in an ultrasound tech from home that night. They both had this surprise look, and it's like, oh, I'm losing these babies. They determine that the stretching of Jackie's 55-year-old uterus is the cause of her bleeding. But they also discover something shocking. 
And I can read ultrasounds, and well, there's the one, there's a heartbeat, there's the second one, there's the heartbeat. Wait a minute. <laughs> and he looked over at me and he's like, triplets? You're having three babies. And I'm like, mom, there are three babies. You're really, there's three babies in there. She's like, no, there's not. I'm like, yeah, there is. One of the two implanted embryos has split. Jackie is now carrying two more babies than anyone expected at the beginning. My mom's like, Kim, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> Let's see if we can hear some heartbeats yet. With the stakes raised yet again, Kim, Joe, and Jackie meet with Dr. Robert Kiwi, <laughs> a high-risk pregnancy specialist, for an evaluation. <laughs> Here was a grandmother carrying triplets for her daughter. This was a very strange and somewhat unusual situation, and I'm sure that I won't see that probably my lifetime again. We had named them. We knew where they were and what position in my mom's stomach, so when I felt her stomach, I would talk to each baby. We were very attached. Look at them moving! Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but being pregnant with a multiple pregnancy, was clearly something that could have risks for her. But there's also a problem with two of the babies who are identical twins. They had two separate sacs, but shared a placenta. One could take all the nutrients and not give the other any nutrients at all and not continue to develop, which would jeopardize the entire pregnancy. At that point, we may lose all of them. We talked to them about the potential of doing what's called selective reduction, where you can actually abort uh, one pregnancy or even two. My mom looked at me and she said, absolutely not. I don't care if it kills me. I'm having these babies. Determined to carry the pregnancy, Jackie goes back to her active life and seems to take carrying triplets in stride. I went to work every day, went home and gardened, but I didn't really gain much weight and didn't show being pregnant with triplets, and I worked up until the day they, day before they took the babies. Despite the risks, the family decides to move forward with the pregnancy. We started to be nervous and worry. They told us that we would be up there for monitoring every week to make sure they were healthy and my mom was healthy. But as the weeks go by, the triplets appear to be developing normally, and Jackie remains healthy. <laughs> These are my grandkids. <laughs> We actually found out that we were having all three girls. You are incubator. She That's is right. Grandma incubator. At 29 weeks, they reach a crucial milestone, and everyone breathes a huge sigh of relief. We had made it past the really dangerous time to the point of where, if the babies were born early, they were viable. They are out of the woods, they think, until the 33-week mark when Jackie goes in for her next prenatal visit. You could sense that something was wrong, and they said, you know, get to the doctor, have the doctor come in and look, and I'm like, this isn't normal. The risk for the babies included what's called twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome. Being identical twins, there can often be reversal of blood flow across the placentas. One baby would be considered a donor and the other one a recipient. It appears that Gabriella, one of the twins, is receiving all the nutrients from the placenta while her sister, Carmina, is getting none. It's a highly dangerous situation. Dr. Kiwi wanted us to go home, pack our bags, get to the hospital right away. No matter what, we're delivering first thing in the morning. Early the next morning, Jackie is wheeled into the OR for an emergency C-section. They had between 30 and 40 people there for the delivery. They let Joe and I come in the room, and we got to watch the entire thing. You're excited because they're coming, and you're nervous because they're coming. Um, you know, they're still 10 weeks early. <laughs> Elizabeth is the first baby out. And she looked really good. She looked really healthy. I just was overwhelmed with joy. I mean, she looked. Perfect. Next, the identical twins. First, Carmina, the one who has stopped growing. She's the baby in the most peril. She didn't look good at all. She was 
like a grayish color. The tiniest baby I've ever seen in my entire life. She was two pounds. And instantly, they just whisked her away, and it appeared that she wasn't breathing. I had to force myself to sit there because everything inside of me was making me go over to that baby, and I couldn't. They wouldn't let me near her. They wouldn't let me see her. We went from the happiest moment to, oh my gosh, that's our child, and is she going to live, or is she going to die? Gabriella, the other identical twin, is the last to be delivered. And she looked better than Carmina, but still not as great as Elizabeth. But I could tell that she was OK. Okay, All the babies are rushed to the neonatal intensive care unit, and there's concern about all three of them. You always worry about premature babies because they can uh, behave differently once they're born. The most significant issue is respiratory distress syndrome. They may require oxygen. They can have problems with the eyes uh, developing now or even later. In addition, these babies can have significant problems later in life, things like cerebral palsy, uh, neurological defects, uh, it's a variety of uh, uh, mental and physical handicaps that can develop. They told us that they're not out of the woods by any means. They told us to take it day by day, hour by hour at first, then day by day. They told us that they had a honeymoon period where they would do great, but that at a certain point, expect setbacks. It happens with all NICU babies. Um, we didn't have any. But Jackie does. After being released from the hospital, her internal stitches began leaking. All of a sudden, her life was in danger. When the surgeon saw her, it was immediate. He said, you're going straight for surgery. I have to clear the rest of my day. I have to operate now, because in the morning, if we don't get this taken care of, you could be dead. <laughs> you, I mean, you are very sick. Jackie is touch and go for a while, but the emergency surgery corrects the problem. Within, you know, couple weeks, she really was walking again, outside working in her flower beds, back up to see the babies as often as she could because they stayed in the NICU for you know, seven to eight weeks. Look at her big eyes. To everyone's relief, after nearly two months in the NICU, the triplets are all doing well enough that they are cleared to go home. Thanks, Grandma. <laughs> they are just a barrel of laughs all the time. They are some characters. They're just amazing. And Jackie's now famous, not only for giving birth to her own grandchildren, but also because she's believed to be the oldest woman in the US to deliver triplets. To me, it was just another thing I did to make my my daughter happy. You're supposed to go home. I absolutely can never repay her. She gave us three of the most beautiful things in the world. She was so unselfish, so sacrificing, she truly gave us the ultimate gift of life. Keep breathing, Sylvie. Nice and easy. February 26, 2009. Sarah Reinfelder is wheeled into the delivery room. The atmosphere is tense and the prognosis unclear. But her doctors know one thing. They're about to witness something that defies all medical logic. This is a case that I will never forget. Sarah and Shane Reinfelder of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, are just beginning their life together as husband and wife when they get an unexpected surprise. 
I got pregnant within the first three months of our marriage. We weren't actually planning for kids. We were both kind of shocked. Then I was at work one day and started feeling real crampy in my stomach. I just wasn't feeling good. And I realized I was bleeding. Shane rushed me to the emergency room. And they said that what was happening from the cramping was that she was miscarrying. I was in shock. I had to sit there and try and tell myself, this is really actually happening. You know, you can't do anything about it. But while Sarah's at the hospital, the doctor discovers something even more devastating. She's like, well, you have two uteruses. Did you know that? And I was like, no, I didn't know that. Sarah's condition is extremely rare. It's called uterine didelphus and occurs in less than 0.05% of women in the world. That is why you miscarried. The two uteri share a muscle wall intended for just one uterus. As a result, the muscle tends to be thinner and weaker, almost always resulting in miscarriage or preterm delivery. She told us because of my uterine abnormality that I was probably never gonna be able to have kids in my life, ever. I was very mad, and I thought, why on earth can I not just have a normal body like everybody else? This has not happened to everybody. Why is it happening to me? It's just a hard-hitting blow that you don't really, you don't see coming. Pretty much all that was running through our mind was how much we wanted to have babies of our own and how much we wanted to have our own family. And it felt like someone just completely came in and just ripped it all away from you. I thought it was completely just the end but it isn't the end. In fact, it's just the start of an emotionally draining roller coaster ride that will go on for nearly two more years. You know, I told Shay, I was like, I feel like I'm pregnant, but I, there's no way I'm pregnant. He was like, no, you're not pregnant. We broke down and got a pregnancy test and it popped up positive. And I was like, okay, but you know, it could be false positive. You know, they said I couldn't have kids. So we ended up going to the doctor, sure enough, there's little baby baby. And we about jumped out of our skin. And we were so happy. And we actually saw the baby. You know, the baby was healthy. The baby was growing, you know, wiggling. You know, Shane called him a little amoeba. Given her high risk condition, Sarah is put on strict bed rest and monitored closely. As the weeks progress, the couple's hopes begin to grow. I kept going to the doctor. They kept checking the baby. Oh. You know, the baby's fine. They basically told her there is a slight chance that you could carry this one long enough that we could do a C-section and the baby could survive. That means hitting a minimum of 27 or 28 weeks. Well, there was just like a flood of relief knowing that, you know, we might stand a chance this time. But suddenly, Sarah starts bleeding and the thought of miscarriage is back on everyone's mind. After about a month, the bleeding just stopped. It just stopped. You know, I was figuring, you know, okay, it stopped. It'll be back in a couple days. It never came back. I ended up going through the rest of my pregnancy with my son just, just fine. It went perfect. Take a nice breath. You'll be all right. We got to turn her in head first. Defying all odds, Sarah makes it. And on April 8th, 2008, she and Shane welcome a healthy six pound, 10 ounce baby William into the world. Put everything behind us, you know, the miscarriage, everything, the heartache, it was gone. You know, we had this wonderful little baby boy. We had our little family and we were happy with it. But just three months after the birth of their miracle baby, Sarah is pregnant again. This time, she'll make headlines around the world. This is going to be a, a bit of a surprise. Rather than seeing one baby, there are two. And he looks at it, he goes, yeah. He's like, you're having a double pregnancy. There is a baby in each uterus. This is extremely rare. Only about 70 women in the world have ever been known to be pregnant with a baby in each of two wombs. And only a small percentage of those pregnancies have made it to delivery. As a result, Sarah's pregnancies are not expected to last long. In fact, she and her husband, Shane, can't even find a doctor willing to see her through. Nobody wanted anything to do with it. <laughs> they said, I didn't even know that this problem existed until you guys are up here, you know? After a desperate search, 
the couple is finally referred to a team of OBGYNs led by doctors Connie Hedmark and Brianna Pond. Sarah. Shane. Hi, I'm Dr. Hedmark. Nice really you. nice to meet you. This is a case that I will never forget. I'll probably never see this again. And I still am, you know, shocked by the whole thing. You have a very unusual situation going on. What happened in Sarah's case is she has two ovaries in each one ovulated, so that an egg was released from each ovary, passed on through the fallopian tubes, then fertilized, and the pregnancy was implanted, one on each side, one in each uteri. They occurred basically at the same time or within 24 hours. It's not like they were weeks apart. They couldn't be. A woman can't get pregnant in a second uterus when she's already pregnant in the first. The body won't produce another ovulation after the first pregnancy is underway. You, you certainly are breaking all the odds, you know that. <laughs> At first our thought was, well, it's not even gonna happen anyway. The odds that you would actually be able to carry a baby in each uterus to viability, which is essentially past 24 weeks, is extremely rare. The numbers come up to be something like one in three to five million. The problem is, is that when there are two uteri, there can be an inequality of the strength of the uterus. So the risk of miscarriage goes way up, possibility of preterm delivery to the point where viability is just simply not a possibility. We could lose both babies. When a baby is born prematurely, um, they have a very high chance of difficulty with their lung development, respiratory difficulties. They can even have problems with their brain. With a pregnancy like this, it's a, it's a package. Um, you're worried about the babies, you're worried about the mom. We evaluate the babies on a fairly frequent basis by ultrasound and monitoring to make sure that there's adequate growth. I'm 20 weeks into the pregnancy. You know, we, we found out, you know, that they were both girls. My husband was hoping for two boys, but two girls. And um, we found out they were both girls. I was excited. I'm never, no longer gonna be outnumbered. And um, so we're feeling a little bit better about life. We're feeling, you know, that, that there's gonna be some hope here. You know, we're not out of the woods. We're nowhere close to being out of the woods yet, but, you know, we're at least halfway through the woods. It's your first baby? No, no. second and third. Wow. Some of the special precautions that were necessary with Sarah was to make sure that she was at bed rest and not doing anything strenuous because with her decreased activity, we could decrease the risk of preterm labor. To everyone's amazement, the precautions actually seem to work. And in late December 2008, the babies passed the crucial 24-week mark. We were happy, we were thrilled, shocked. It's at this point that we begin to get excited that we think, you know, we're gonna make this. We are actually gonna get babies. We're gonna get two babies. So from there, every week was just icing on the cake. Once we got to that mark, then we started going, no way, now, now what? Doctors Headmark and Pond know they must prepare for the delivery of two babies from separate uteri, something few doctors in the world have ever done before. When we got to 32 weeks and Sarah's health was deteriorating, ultimately we knew we were gonna have to make a decision soon as to when we deliver. Sure enough, I started going into labor. I think I'm ready. You know, I'm having contractions. I'm going into labor completely. Dr. Hedmark's on her way over. Although we got to 33 weeks, they're still seven weeks premature, and that's not a small number. Everybody finally realizes that we're gonna have to have the babies that day, within the hour. Well, that's a pretty good contraction. And I am freaking out. When you have a baby in each uterus, the chance of a vaginal delivery just is really not possible because they're gonna be competing for the exit. So we knew that we would be delivering Sarah by cesarean section. I've done thousands of C-sections, but not one side by side. So I was concerned what would happen to the other baby while I was taking care of the first baby. We're gonna have a baby here soon, Sarah. 
When I entered the abdomen, I decided to deliver the baby on the left first. That just seemed anatomically the easier one to get to first. Usually, even with twins, you have one big uterus, but here you had two big uteri, which is something you're just not accustomed to seeing. I want to see what's going on. Pretty soon, Sarah. She's looking oh. good. And all of a sudden, we hear the best scream I've ever heard in my life. Let's pray we have baby in. Okay. We heard Kaylin come out screaming her lungs out. You know, here's baby A, and they pulled pulled out Kaylin and held her up over the curtain, and it was it was wonderful. But it isn't long before things take a frightening turn. Delivery of the first baby unexpectedly causes the weight of the second to shift and rotate, putting the second uterus dangerously out of reach. I was worried about how I was going to get to the baby, because as soon as you deliver one baby, the second baby uh, needs to be delivered as soon as possible. With extreme care, Dr. Hedmark and her team attempt to manually twist the second uterus back into position. You just focus. You focus on what you know you need to do, and you just concentrate. After struggling for nearly two frightening minutes, doctors finally reach the second baby. And we heard a second scream, and Valerie come out, and she was fine. She's looking really good. She's breathing oh. on her own. Just knowing that they were alive at that moment was wonderful. It was a relief that we had been waiting for. When you see these babies and they come out crying and you just think, this is just truly amazing. I will never see this again in my life and this is why I do this job. The twins spend seven weeks in the neonatal intensive care unit before going home. Now, at just over a year old, the girls are happy, healthy, and have earned their spot in the medical history books. I got my boy, I got two girls, I'm, I'm set. I'm the luckiest person in the world. I'm thankful that I have my, my two girls and my baby boy. I like to think that every pregnant mom has a right to believe her pregnancy is the most special. But some things are just so unusual that they do stand out, and you can't help but be amazed at what nature can do.